Coming up to chill, what's the plan, bruh? Everything is awesome when you're a panda. There are some animals whose entire existence proves that nature isn't about survival of the fittest. It's survival of just barely being good enough. If life was a class, it wouldn't be about passing with straight A's. It'd be about passing off your DNA before you become an F in the chat. And some animals are universally recognized as the remedial students of nature. Cheetahs are the red-headed stepchild of the cat world. Sloths are basically free calories served on a moss blade. And roasting koalas is considered low-hanging fruit only because they happen to share the same IQ. And also because they put the mid in chlamydia. And it seems that everyone can agree that pandas are egregiously bad at pandaing and that we as a society need to stop being this biracial Winnie the Pooh's crutch and just let nature finish what it's clearly started. But are pandas really that bad? Did we successfully gaslight the barcode bears of the world? Or do pandas really profit off the most OP, pretty privileged genjutsu nature's ever seen? To find out, first we gotta lay out all the factors that make the try to panda challenge virtually impossible. But before that, this video was sponsored by absolutely no one. Let's get it. You probably already know that the panda's biggest problem revolves around it being a bamboo sink. 99% of the things that meets this oversized aquality hamster's gullet is bamboo. Despite clearly being designed with carnivore software, it's the koala problem of building your entire meal plan around something that gives you very little back. Which is why pandas can spend up to 16 hours a day eating something they can only digest 17% of. The very definition of injustice is that when you google sloth bear, this monochromatic tryhard vegan doesn't show up since their diet of scarfing bamboo often leaves them with very little energy for anything else. So to accommodate this self-imposed energy budget, pandas developed relatively smaller sized organs including, you guessed it, their brains. And something else, but we'll get to that. But yeah, being a bimbo for bamboo might have literally nerfed their intelligence in the process. And some of you may have asked yourselves why the breathing bamboo purses don't just hibernate, since hibernation is basically power save mode for animals, and if anyone needs to save energy, it's pandas. Well, one, bears technically aren't even true hibernators. But two, even if they were, eating like the vegan teacher's lapdog means pandas are physically incapable of putting on the fat reserves required to hibernate for months at a time without also getting perma-slept to starvation. But honestly, the problems with their diet have low-key been overblown. If being a bamboo junkie was their only issue, they wouldn't be as chronically down bad. At their core, animals have two main goals, food, and another F word my mom doesn't like me to say. We see how they handle their meal prep, but it's their love life that really screws pandas over. Pandas are absurdly bad at making more pandas. Off rip, their window to reproduce isn't even really a window, it's more like a hairline crack in the windshield. Female pandas ovulate one to three days out of the entire year. That's only 24 to 72 hours are open for business out of a possible 8,760. And since being bent on bamboo means they eat, sleep, and socialize like a stereotypical Reddit user, finding a possible partner is often equally as difficult for them. Even if he does manage to track a female down, he still has a high risk of fumbling the opportunity because males are apparently illiterate at reading signs. Male pandas often struggle to interpret the signs that a female actually wants to mate. Word. And when you only have hours on the clock, mistakes like that ensure that the only thing getting screwed is the future of your progeny. And even if the female's 100% with it, it's still not a for sure thing. Partly because male pandas struggle through the process of procreation in a way that is almost impressive, but also partly due to the panda's reportedly disproportionately tiny penis. Which is why panacoitus is a lot like trying to get a quarter inch USB into a port blind, while also wearing a 200 pound fat suit. Oh, and try without using thumbs. Nature did this obese oppression raccoon zero favors. Their mating habits are a big reason why the double stuffed Ursus Oreos are where they're at. Pandas and breeding programs in captivity often show so little interest in their literal only job that researchers have resorted to showing them videos of pandas mating. Apart from pulling videos from Panda Hub, researchers have also resorted to giving them actual Viagra. Although you'd need a magnifying glass to see if it's working because again, the P in panda does not stand for packing. And even though most pandas rely on the grace of God as a wingman, somehow the jihad of life doesn't end once they add new names to the roster. Pandas are some of the worst parents on the planet. You've probably heard that if a panda has twins, one of them is a guaranteed loss since the mother panda will abandon half her litter and leave that one twin to die. Which is even worse when you consider that grizzly bears will allegedly disown their cubs, but they only do it when there's one, since they'd rather start over with two to four cubs than put all their hopes in stock in one. The chosen panda cub doesn't get off scot-free either, since the yin yang colored chonk bears of China have the highest mother to baby size ratio of any mammal. To put it in perspective, humans are typically 20 times bigger than their babies. Mother African elephants are typically 45 times heavier. A mama panda is approximately 900 times the size of her newborn baby. And since they don't have pouches like marsupials, that puts the panda at a legitimate risk of being turned into a chalk outline by its own oblivious mother. Just another way nature set this glorified cow gerbil up for failure. And it's not even like domestication is an option. A good reason is cause, despite what the black and white beta bamboo might tell you, it's still a bear, and a bear is a bear is a bear. And the black sheep of the bear brotherhood is still liable to absolutely fold any human. 
especially since the one plus of constantly crushing bamboo is a bite force comparable to big cats like lions. In case you thought this plus size Oreo was sweet, one man nearly lost his whole leg after a giant panda wandered onto his land and crushed his leg like celery. Then there's the fact that a high volume, low efficient diet means the one man bamboo processing plant known as the panda can poop a healthy 40 times a day. And of course, living in the chilly, mountainous forests of Asia, pandas figured out that they can stay warm by rolling around and covering themselves in fresh manure. So if you want to add a biting, eating, pooping, sewer smelling dependent to your family, like I always say, you're better off having children. Because there are no tax credits for providing for pandas. In fact, the opposite, pandas quite literally cost millions of dollars just to keep alive. But mostly that's because giant pandas are leased by the Chinese government at approximately a fat million a year. And if one of those pandas gets knocked up, that'll set you back a cub tax of about 400,000. Which is why, currently, only three zoos in the US have a biracial bamboo munching beanbag of a bear on display. One of those zoos used to be San Diego. I say used to, because one of the consequences of renting pandas is that gives China the ammunition to be petty. I'm not a political channel, I'll never be a political channel. I'm not implying any type of affiliation or bias. I'm just listing two things that happened. In 2019, Trump may or may not have fueled a trade war against China. And come May 2019, a mother panda and her son were recalled and sent back to China. Now you could argue the trade war had nothing to do with it and this was just the natural end of a panda loan. But 10 years earlier in 2009, Taishan the panda was deported not long after Obama met with the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama is, as far as China is concerned, an op. So my working theory is China uses pandas for diplomacy, but also as a vehicle of petty punishment. That's not really the pandas fault, but at this point we might as well hold it against them too. We didn't even mention the fact that pandas aren't even really pandas. When zoologist Federic Cuvier first used the word panda in 1825, he was describing the red-headed raccoon we call the red panda. The furry orca known as the giant panda wasn't named until much later and it only got its name because at the time they thought it had a lot in common with the red panda. Turns out they're not even close to being related, meaning this overgrown zebra yogi isn't even the original panda. And the fact that its monochrome mugshot shows up first when you type panda and not live action shifu is one of the biggest injustices of nature. This is the OG panda, but the newspaper flavored cloud guzzling frost took up just enough space to convince the world otherwise. So obviously pandas have their problems and you can argue that their best trait is being a luck merchant. There is no other animal that gets carried harder by pretty privilege than the endgame of a sloth bear raccoon orgy. And they're the only creature on earth with black and white privilege. Because the reason giant pandas are the mascot of the World Wildlife Fund is literally because having a mascot with the same color patterns as 1940s TV saves you a lot of money on ink. Yo, that sounds like a joke, but I'm not even kidding. If pandas were black and yellow or black and brown, they might not have gotten the job. But that aside, consensus is that pandas are so bad at panding that we should just let the flex of China fade into oblivion the way nature intended. But is that really true, or have we just been doing giant pandas incredibly dirty this entire time? First thing to mention is that they're a specialist species, with that specialty being in binging bamboo. Being a specialist rather than a generalist means you can typically tap into a niche nobody else can. But that means they can adapt to changes in their environment, and that also means that there are only a couple things going wrong away from getting evicted from reality. Having a very particular set of skills might be great if you're Liam Neeson, but it can severely handicap you as a species. And the funny thing is, for all the crap pandas get, the biggest and arguably most intimidating land predator on the planet is a specialist. Polar bears depend almost entirely on sea ice to hunt, and if that goes away, then it's bye-bye ice bear. But for some reason, we don't on the polar bear nearly as much for being dependent on ice as we lampoon pandas for their life choices. Especially since it's habitat destruction and fragmentation that really had giant pandas down bad. You see, it's believed the panda bear once had more variety in his diet and was more omnivorous. But likely because there was just so much bamboo everywhere and virtually zero competition for it, eventually they shifted into primarily eating bamboo. It also turns out that the bamboo they eat is high in protein, but low in carbs. So despite seeming like that one person that would bring a veggie burger to a cookout, weirdly enough, the giant panda's protein intake is actually close to that of wolves. They're also particular about the part of bamboo they like to eat and when. According to studies on radio collared pandas, in the summer and spring they prefer to eat the protein packed shoots found at higher altitudes. But during autumn and winter they migrate down into the valley and shift more towards eating bamboo leaves which are high in vitamin C along with roots. And they just move from high to low to high again year in and year out. Something that's clearly worked for them since they've been just fine like this for thousands of years. So much so that the umami taste receptor, i.e. the one that lets you experience the savory taste of meat, yeah theirs got turned off. And they even evolved a false thumb for no other reason than to help them hold bamboo. So clearly pandas had a process that worked. The problem is when you fragment the habitat they spent thousands of years in and separate them from the food, the result is less pandas. We love to say pandas are bad at life, but by receding their habitat like a middle-aged hairline, we haven't made living any easier. Also the whole point I made about pandas being bad at making whoopee, turns out that might just be propaganda. Cause in a twist, the giant panda's reproductive rate really isn't that much worse than that of American black bears. And black bears? 
they're doing just fine. In fact, everything I said about pandas having negative riz really only applies to those in captivity. In the wild, female pandas do have a small window for baby making, but that's often after a selection process that involves at least two males running fades for her honor. In a process that can last up to and over a week. And we now believe that this process might just be what stimulates ovulation. You can't really replicate that in a zoo, and between that and a constant flow of people, that's probably the biggest reason why pandas in captivity become celibate. Like be real, if you were forced into an arranged marriage and had to have an audience watch you consummate it, you'd be a little awkward too. There is no bigger indictment than the fact that a zoo in Hong Kong had been trying to hook up two pandas for the better part of 10 years. And it wasn't until a certain beer virus of 2020 shut down the zoo to the public that the two bears finally got it on. Roommates for 10 years and all it took was a couple months of privacy for them to fornicate. But even with all the slander, pandas are actually in pretty good shape. And that is a problem. With about 2,000 pandas alive today, pandas were recently demoted off the endangered species list. Yet giant pandas still finesse a bulk of conservation efforts, simply because they're cute. Think about it for a second, pandas have big eyes, big foreheads, and chonk physique. If they didn't remind us of babies, we wouldn't be this invested in their future. There's like 400 blobfish left in the entire world, and you probably didn't know that because, real talk, nobody's buying their child a plushie that looks like a deflated sunfish fetus. Not to mention the animals that could legitimately destroy entire ecosystems if they go ghost, like bees or certain types of plants. They become an afterthought because, yeah, pretty gets priority. It's like that one gym teacher that ignores actually struggling students to help the attractive girls in class that don't need or ask for it. That's right, pandas are hot girls. Side note, why does it always seem like the gym teacher's on felonious timing? Pandas aren't perfect, they're miles away from it, but at the end of the day, we've done far more to them than for them. But that's gonna do it for this video. Be sure to check out my book for 100 animals that can absolutely fold you like a lawn chair, link in description. Drink water, you need that stuff. Hug your mother, tell pops you appreciate him. Matter of fact, might have to make a Father's Day video in the name of equality. But until then, I'ma see y'all in the next one. Now for y'all that watched till the end, here's some panda ASMR.